All right. Hey guys. It's Wednesday. We got these creepers creeping over here. Um, it's Wednesday. It's hump day. Lesson of the day. So a um, lot of today was all facelift consults, all of it, which is fantastic because uh, I have my dream practice growing, which is I do a lot of revision rhinoplasty and I'm a revision rhinoplasty specialist. Um, but revision rhinoplasties are a lot of energy and I end up never getting to show the photos because people like to keep them private more than facelift. So um, I'm doing less and less noses, I think. And now I'm getting more and more facelift consults, which is kind of where I think I want my life to go, but we'll see. So either way, repetitive facelift stuff today, but there were some issues that came up or questions about autoimmune problems. So this is my lesson of the day about autoimmune issues. And we'll start with basic understanding of them. So autoimmune processes or autoimmune diseases or issues mean that your body has a sensitivity to itself. And uh, it's kind of like an allergy. Hmm? Okay. So uh, it means like you have an allergy to yourself, which means that your body builds up antibodies that can attack your own body. And it's a type five allergy out of the types of allergies. And um, the issues with that is you never know how your body's gonna react to something. So uh, I saw a friend just now who has scleroderma. Scleroderma is part of an array of autoimmune issues in most cases, but some patients have just isolated scleroderma and it is a soft tissue uh, disorder where you get scarring over time that ends up shrinking your soft tissues. You lose the SMAS layer and the lamina propria and mucosa and everything shrinks over time. So you get really tight lips, really tight skin. Benefit of that is that you don't really age when it comes to like the face and neck. Everything stays so tight because it's fibrotic. The downside is you end up getting a little shriveled around the mouth and skeletonized earlier in life and you get darkening around the mouth in a circle and you start to get this concentric puckering where you get the little lipstick bleed lines earlier and your lip volume keeps shrinking. So these patients try to chase it with filler to no avail. So, oh, hello, Dr. Kao. So if you chase it to no avail, the scleroderma is a very, very difficult thing to treat. So patients usually come in for scleroderma first to look at the lips. Uh, regular fillers with scleroderma don't work so well. So you use Restylane Kiss, Restylane this, that, Volbella, Volure, they don't work so well. Interestingly, the one that retains the best is Juvederm. It's the classic Juvederm and Juvederm XC. They tend to be the two best. Um, they still get eaten up rather quickly, but they do stay a little bit longer and hydrate the lip a little bit better. Uh, something that is more, not experimental, but not 100% effective is uh, that we inject nanofat and PRP to try to improve the soft tissue health of the area around the mouth. And that tends to regenerate a little bit of smas and they look less shriveled around the mouth in a lot of those cases. Uh, but again, doesn't always work on people, but it is a very, I'd say generally effective thing to use and very safe and tends to work a little bit better than the other treatments of fillers. Then we have lip lifts. Lip lifts on scleroderma are rarely indicated. There are some patients who have a very long gap, uh, but in those patients it can help, but most patients with scleroderma don't have a long upper lip because they're fibrotic and they're tight and it's pulled against the teeth. And the issue with doing a lip lift on somebody with scleroderma is that you're gonna increase their tooth show and they already look skeletonized and you end up making them look a little more skeletonized. So you wanna leave that soft tissue there to have a nice harmony between the soft tissue skeleton and the bony skeleton being your bone and your teeth and things like that. So um, it's, it's not often indicated, but there are patients with long philtrums and it would help them get more accent when you do a lip lift. The uh, thing that you don't get though is increased volume. When you lift somebody with uh, scleroderma, it's uncommon that you would get increased volume unless they have very weak scleroderma or very early scleroderma where they still have mucosa that can come out. So in those patients, you would need to combine with nanofat PRP or you'd have to combine with fillers at a later time or a VY plasty, but a VY plasty in somebody with scleroderma is a little bit less predictable uh, because you can't really release the mucosa and bring it out so much. So we are limited, but you usually need to do multiple treatments for cases like that. So that's scleroderma and what we see mostly with it. 
Um, the other autoimmune issues that we see pretty often are with the hair. And patients have uh, either alopecia areata, which means they can get little spots of hair, circles or satellites that fall out, or there's alopecia totalis, which is all your hair falls out. The uh, treatments for that are using either monoclonal antibodies, so IVIG and things like that, that can help while you're getting the attacks, um, more effective than most doctors realize, or we do injections with 5-FU or steroids into those areas when it happens. Um, the mistake some doctors make is they try to regenerate some hair with PRP, platelet-rich plasma. So if you didn't know it, platelet-rich plasma, it is a component of blood that we take out. So we draw your blood, spin it down into plasma, which is about half the volume, and then we spin that down into platelet-rich plasma, sorry, at the bottom, which is all the sediment, and platelet-poor plasma on the top. We take out the platelet-rich plasma, and uh, we inject it into the scalp on patients who have normal healthy scalps and they have hair loss. So it slows hair loss or stops hair loss and then some people it gets regrowth. If you take that and inject it into somebody who has an autoimmune disorder that's causing the hair loss, you might piss it off and put, you know, you're pretty much putting fuel into the autoimmune disorder and you're putting more cells there and the cells get it, uh, draw in more immune cells and they attack the hair more and you lose more hair. So. PRP is, although I'd say it's a soft contraindication for people who have autoimmune disorders that cause hair loss, because PRP will just make it worse. Nanofat similarly um, might cause a bit of an inflammatory reaction, which could piss it off, uh, or it could help. It's, it's unknown, but you're taking a chance when you do those things. So autoimmune issues make things a bit tricky when we're doing uh, procedures like, uh, like PRP or things with the lips. <clears throat> autoimmune disorders, uh, or related ones like rheumatoid arthritis typically don't cause that kind of issue and we don't worry about them so much. So it's usually the other ones where we're worried about all this stuff. So um, when it comes to autoimmune disorders, realize that the doctor who's doing a cosmetic procedure on you can rarely give you a known risk analysis. They can't tell you, hey, listen, you have exactly a 50% chance of this happening or 20% chance of that happening. You just have to look at what's causing the autoimmune problem and think to yourself like, okay, if I did this procedure, could something bad happen because of the autoimmune disorder? So um, that's where both the doctor and the patient have to discuss things and kind of share responsibility to figure out, hey, you know, what can we do for you without hurting you? And um, in cases like skin disorders and you're trying to improve the, the face, it becomes very, very difficult. And um, similarly, if you have a smoker, you have to have the same discussion saying, well, you're a smoker, you have these things working against you, what can I do for you safely? In some issues, in, in some instances, you might want to do nothing at all because doing something is worse than nothing. Where uh, I had a smoker today and I advised her, listen, if you don't stop smoking, um, we can't do the surgery. It's not that I'm going to do the surgery and expose you to risk, it's I'm going to cancel your surgery because I don't want to cause a problem in a patient, even though they think it's safe. And this patient was super with it, so she's not an issue. Uh, but I have had patients in the past who don't wanna stop smoking, and the issue with that is, when we're doing these procedures, we're damaging your body, and we're doing it and causing an injury, and we wait for your body to heal the injury. The last thing you wanna do is, when you're doing this out of choice, from a cosmetic procedure, you don't wanna throw in variables to say, well, okay, let me throw in some smoking, let me throw in some bad nutrition or bad diet and see what happens in this. Uh, elective injury that we cause. So um, we do want to keep the patients as safe as possible and we stop smoking to stop the nicotine and to stop the inflammatory processes. So that's it. Quick thing for today. We'll go over some questions if anybody has. So there's no questions written there, but let's see. Was that Angela D? Well, Angela's been here. Uh, we did some lip filler on her, but she's not here now. Um, let's go through a couple other questions. What age do we start Botox at? You can start at any age, depending on what it's for. I uh, don't want to start for no reason though. Fire alarm battery needs to be changed. Yeah, probably. Um, hello cousin. Am I not Philip's friend anymore? Philip, many Philips, but yes, I am Philip's friend. Uh, profound versus face type plus Morpheus. I've had a couple consults of Dallas and it's down to those two. So separate issue, but profound is good for tightening of the skin of the whole face and it gets 
a big, the biggest improvement safely in one shot. Uh, Morpheus is nice for the face, but you have to do like four or five times usually to get actual skin tightening, but you can get skin quality improvements with less. And face tight shouldn't be used in the face. Face tight's used for the neck, so they're usually used in the neck um, to melt some fat and get heat contraction. I prefer, if someone needs to get rid of fat, I prefer lipo, cold lipo with profound. I feel like it's a little bit less risky because it is less risky. Um, heat treatments in the neck are a little bit risky. Um, still not a bad treatment though. PRP or PRF to treat the quality of the tear troughs. So tear troughs you can use PRF, which is platelet-rich fibrin, tends to have a little bit more of a result than platelet-rich plasma. I personally don't have a lot of experience with it, but uh, from all my colleagues, I've seen the results and that seems to be the case. You can also place a little bit of nano fat, and what this does, it doesn't volumize the area, it just makes it look a little healthier somehow. Uh, what you don't wanna do is inject uh, sclerosins like radius and those kind of things. I look 12 and I'm 42, I age backwards, that's good. Um, who do you recommend for blepharoplasty in New York? Oh, there's so many. Um, Dr. Robert Schwartz is good. Stephen Perlman's good. Dara Leota is good. Andrew Giacono is good. All right, let's see. Can we talk about nasogenian filler? Not sure what that is. Thoughts on plasma radiofrequency, treatments like opus. So plasma is different than radiofrequency, is different than plasma pen. So plasma... A laser was a it's a plasma which means it's not a laser it's like doing a helium plasma j plasma those kind of things it's uh it's a reaction that happens at the edge or the tip of the wand that you're using and uh, it can burn areas then there's plasma pen which you're just burning little tiny dots on the face and that pretty much doesn't work and then radio frequency is very very different do i think sculpture is good sculpture is fine i like to use it for people who are very gaunt and you can't fill uh, with fat or filler and you just want general fullness you have to form scar tissue to do that can you do profound more than once yes you can do profound more than once i wouldn't do it too many times or too aggressively at once so what about hashimoto's should they have prp hashimoto's uh there are very few contraindications with hashimoto's so uh, Hashim patients with Hashimoto's are generally considered safe to have uh, PRP for injections on the face or things like that. Any increased risk with type 1 diabetes? Yes. So if your A1C is not controlled well, um, your A1C is a marker of how much glycosylation or how much sugar you have sitting on your cells. Um, and it means you've had too much sugar in your body at all times. Sugar can damage the function of your cells, including your immune cells and your healing cells. So. Um, if somebody has a high A1C or chronically high blood sugar, then yes, you have very, very uh, high risk during surgery of poor healing, especially like a facelift or something like that. Morpheus versus Oralift and Profound by my cousin, Shida. Uh, I like Profound the best for skin tightening. Morpheus is second best, and Oralift is the best face neck lift ever. Um, blah, 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 blah. So... I think we got lots of questions. Dysport or Botox, doesn't matter. They're both good. What if they have hypothyroidism leading to hair loss? So for hypothyroidism, uh, you have to stabilize the thyroid function first. And stabilizing thyroid function takes a year in some people. Anytime you change your thyroid medication, you're fluctuating for about three months until it really stabilizes. And if you have soft tissue uh, changes or hair quality changes from it, that takes three months to see uh, an improvement. So you have to wait for it to stop. Um, before considering other things. You can do PRP in the meanwhile if you want to. PRP and nanofat, it might help a little bit. You can use Nutrafol as well, which is like a uh, hair supplement, which works really nicely. And then some patients use Rogaine as well. If they're, if they're women, they can use it too. They just have to watch out for facial hair. What do you think about home RF devices? They are bullshit. Um, can you treat smokers lines with red light therapy? No, smokers lines you wanna treat with either Botox, filler to give a little bit of volume. Nanofat PRP is amazing for it. So Nanofat PRP regenerates a little bit of the hydration over in that area naturally so you don't have to do filler and then you do laser at the same time. Um, can I do PRP on my lips after silicone removal? You can, uh, it would only really be for softening scar tissue formation. So if it's really, really firm, it might soften it. Silicone though does not respond like we want it to, neither does silicone scar tissue. So don't expect success all the time with that, unfortunately. Okay. 
great, great, great. So, do I know the black pill? I do not. Um, happy Thanksgiving. Oh, that's a nice one. So, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. And Daniela Lopez Osorio, she's the biggest fan. She's the best. All right, wonderful. So, I think we got a lot of the questions. I'm trying to look to see if there's any related. Otherwise, any thoughts on Juvo? Good product. Uh, what about a lip lift? I'm not sure of the question. Okay, well, lesson of the day complete. So, Daniela, see you. So, oh, Dr. Hochstein, best guy in Miami. Uh, all right, hope that answers all the questions. If you guys have any more questions, you can always send to the DMs and uh, sometimes my people will help respond. So I hope everyone has a happy Thanksgiving. I'll do another one of these next week, Wednesday, when we're back from Myrtle Beach. So I'm going to Myrtle Beach. For what? Who knows?